Daniel chapter 6, and Brother Neville was talking about this the other night. All the Bible stories speak on all levels, and we see this when we teach our children, Daniel and the lion's den, and of course they're all nice fluffy animals at that stage, and they love the story of Daniel sleeping down there with the lions, probably poking around to find the softest one to lay down on. And then we get to five days, it gets a little bit cooler. We add that, as Brother Nev said, that layer of knowledge as the children get a little bit older and we get a little bit more formal and we get to teenage years and the teens go, oh, this could be, you know, it's a bit boring. And then we become the adults and we look for the deeper lessons. But I find, I don't know why, but I myself am stuck back here. I, I've always had that problem, I don't know. Anyway, one day I'll make mum proud. So the time frame, brothers and sisters, we're getting right to the end of the 70 years. Daniel's been there for quite a long time. Obviously, we started off when he was a young man in Babylon, made a eunuch, searching and grasping for a, for a reason to serve God when it seemed like there was little reason at all. Nebuchadnezzar has now been gone for at least 24 years and it's not far, we don't know exactly how far until the decree of Cyrus. And when we look at how many uh, kings uh, Daniel has seen and come and gone, you know, Nebuchadnezzar, evil Merodach, Nurgle, Sereza, and all those other uh, odd named regents of Babylon, we could imagine, I guess, that Daniel's life was a source of envy for us because he was daily, or at least weekly or monthly, brushing shoulders with angels. It was one vision after another. And it was relatively easy for Daniel to be living in Babylon. But when you put the chapters chronologically like this and you actually look at it, you realise that's not the case. Because in chapter 1, an angel didn't hold his hand and walk him into Babylon and say, now Daniel, I'm going to be with you when you make this stand. And I'll tell you which of the various uh, challenges that Babylon have to offer to you, you should stand against. There was nothing like that. It was Daniel that had to come up with something. He didn't even receive a vision. Or an acknowledgement from God at the end of it, after the 10 days saying, you yeah, did well. He had to do it in faith. He gets the vision of Nebuchadnezzar revealed to him in chapter 2, and that would have been a huge source of comfort and strength, and it would have been a, a solid affirmation and, and a source of validity, knowing that Daniel, I'm, I must be going the right way. God's done this for me. And he's about 20 years old. And when he hears about the faithful uh, stand of his friends in chapter 3, he wasn't even there. He wasn't cognizant of that at the time. I'm sure it would have added to his faith. There's absolutely no doubt at all. But he didn't see the angel in the fiery furnace. He didn't walk around with them. It was, a, you know, it was a, an account that was secondhand. And then chapter 4, it wasn't his vision. Nebuchadnezzar explained the vision to him and Daniel gave him the, the interpretation. And so we get all the way down from when he was 20 to the four beasts in chapter 7. How many years is there between that? Between the vision that he got from God to explain and interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dream to when he sees the vision of the four beasts on the seashore there in the reign of Belshazzar. That's 50 years and there's nothing in between. 50 years! And then he sees the ram and the he goat not long afterwards, but this creates a whole series of Problems with Daniel seeing these visions, and we'll deal with it tomorrow when we talk about his legacy. Because he didn't understand, and nobody did at that time, the time periods. He didn't realise how long it was going to go on for. He didn't realise that God's going to sack the temple again. And he suffered a nervous breakdown when he found out these, these things. And so those visions, although that added to his connection between earth and the divine... They weren't necessarily a great source of comfort. And in chapter 5, you know, of course, the vision was against uh, Belshazzar and Babylon. And then finally, we get to chapter 9 there when he's praying 
and Gabriel visits him. In chapter 9 and chapter 6, they may be the opposite way around. We're not really sure, but that's, it's right up at the end. And we get this angelic deliverance here with Daniel. And if I was to stand over here, when we look at Daniel's life, if I was to stand over here and say, well, this is Daniel when he was 17, when he first gets into Babylon. And this was on, what day was it? Monday we started. So here's Daniel, 17 years old. And I walk right over here, and this is Daniel now, today. What day is it? It's Friday. He's around about 84 years old. He's a very old man. What's the difference between Daniel over here on Monday and down the track here 60-something years later? What's the difference? That's right. There's just a few wrinkles, maybe less hair, maybe a bit grey. Daniel's no different. This story of Daniel is a model of consistency. This story of Daniel, this is what I love about him. We keep looking at Daniel about what he did and what he said and how he acted, and he was just so consistent. It wasn't Daniel like he was out there searching for something to make a stand against. Babylon was the one that decided what he'd make a stand against because it made him come in to, to question whether or not it transgressed God's law. Daniel was just being Daniel all the time for those 70 years in Babylon. And you've got to love him for that because he's my model and I want to go back home and I want to be a little bit more, more like Daniel. And you do too when you go back to your own ecclesias and when you go back to your job, especially and if you're still at school, whatever it is you're doing. So you go back there and you think, right, Daniel made a stand, so I've got to make a stand. And I'll find a point of difference and I'll make a stand about something. That's really distasteful, that sort of righteousness, that sort of self-righteousness, isn't it? All of a sudden, a person that's never been inclined to be a certain way starts to become a little bit more superior and high and mighty and righteous and better than everybody else. It's not what Daniel did. Daniel just kept making bank all the time. If something came up, he had already resolved in himself to be strong and faithful and it was difficult for him. So when we go home, let's do our readings, let's pray, let's fellowship with one another and let's just resolve in ourselves to become a little bit better than what we were on Monday. Let's just try to be a little bit more like Daniel and take things to the bank so that when something comes up and you decide that you don't want to do it, or you don't want to see it, or you're not going to engage in that conversation that's whinging about the boss, and you start to get to work on time, and people go, hmm, there's something different about you. And when the 15 minutes is up for morning tea, you're already back at work, and now you're content with your wages. Oh my God forbid that would happen. <laughs> and you're not whinging any longer about how a few holidays you get or where you have to go for your holidays and you stop whining and people, they just go, hmm. And after a week, you're still doing those things. The good things, I mean. You, you've and then a month goes by and then six months and then you've banked a whole 12 months and you're back at Bible school and you get reinvigorated again. And then you go back and you're still doing them. And now you've, you come into this realm of consistency and people start to notice, not because you do something outrageous or out of character, but they start to say, oh, that's, that's her just being her. I've got to pick a name. Like, that's Susan. That's just Susan being Susan. That's just, that's just Steve being Steve. He's always like that. Yeah, but the boss said this. He's a... And he knows it too, but he just, he didn't say anything. He sort of just walked away. Yeah, I know this. He doesn't complain much. He just does his work and gets on with it. It's really helpful too. And she's like that all the time. That's Daniel. And I don't want to be like that. It's too hard. They like consistency. 
I like when you guys invite me here, I go bowling and I bowl one strike and I can walk away and go, do that all the time. I can't do it all the time. <laughs> See, one hot day doesn't make a summer. We've got to do it all the time. That is Daniel. It makes, it makes all the difference. And this is this well-known story about Daniel. It's, it's just a wonderful story, this uh, chapter 6. So Daniel's experience of envy from other people who desired, you know, power and uh, control, his faithfulness, his betrayal, the trumped up charges, obviously, and then the rulers, they get themselves all in the dither. There's a, there's a stone with a seal on it. I mean, it's simply amazing. And this, is one, this is another thing. I was talking to another brother about this. I love, when we study this little section about Daniel, this is so much like Christ. Daniel was written before the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. And when you look at him being sold, you know, or delivered for envy, and you think about him going into that, that pit and a seal being put over it and coming out and not saying a word, that is just simply so incredibly prophetic of Christ, and yet it was written beforehand. And it's not like when Christ went through his experiences, he thought, hmm, I'll model my experiences off Daniel. It was prophetic. And there's, critics can't take that away from us. This was written about a man's life which forecast the, the life of the Son of God. It's utterly amazing. I really, really can't believe it. And here his example for all of Israel as their captain, as their hero, as the one who's high and lifted up. He treads the path like Christ for us to follow. And so we look back on Daniel and we should be able to gain some sort of faith and confidence. And we should go home and we should feel just a little bit better about ourselves that we want to try like Daniel and for his sake even. I'd love to be able to get to the kingdom, look at Daniel and have a, have a talk with him over, over a you know, course of time and say, Daniel... You know, the studies on, on your life and the uh, legacy you left behind and that, that model of behaviour. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying I was you know, anything like you, but you really gave me a, some motivation to try, you know. And uh, I thank you for that. Like, that's, that's something to look forward to, brothers and sisters. So look at the man. I mean, we can hardly look at him. He's that good. Check, check out chapter 6. See what it says here? Um, the king says, oh, I've noticed him. There's three presidents, Daniel's one of them, but I'm not sure about my kingdom. I don't want to have any more loss. I want to make sure I curtail any sort of um, diminishing of my kingdom. So it says in verse 3, Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other presidents and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him and the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom, over everybody. N naturally, an anti-Semitic kingdom. And they're going to put a Jew in charge. That's unbelievable. And see where it says there, Daniel became distinguished. Does anybody know what that means? What does distinguished mean? I don't think I've got the... <laughs> yes, but it's very visual. It's Sean? Yes, yes, that's exactly what it means. It means to glitter from afar, to twinkle. And what does that? What glitters from afar? Like a brother said, it's a star. Daniel was our glitter man in Babylon. You couldn't help noticing him. I remember the first time I came over to Hanover, and I, I didn't even know about fireflies. It was one of those um, kids' books I used to read, and I had this fascination with fireflies, and I forgot you had it, and I was walking across from the gym, and I saw them, like, twinkling out of the corner of my eye, and I thought, man, I've been staying up too late. What's going on? And I looked over again, and they were everywhere. Daniel was far superior than that. You couldn't help noticing him. When you walked by, he glittered, he sparkled, he shone. Now, that's a... That's a motif, that's a, that's a symbol in Daniel, isn't it? The idea of a star. And we'll look at it again tomorrow too because, I mean, those wise men who follow the star, I think that's a little reference and, a, and an acknowledgement and back to Daniel himself. But where else do we read about a star in Daniel? To tell us what sort of man he would, was, really. It's in the later chapters. 
12. Yes, chapter 12. Let's have a quick look at that. Look at chapter 12. This is a, it's just such a, a wonderful thing. So it's in the last days. This prophecy still goes on. And at that time, it says, at the end of verse 1, your people will be delivered, Daniel. And many of them, in verse 2, who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Isn't that incredible? Who turned many to righteousness? What does Ezekiel say about three types of saviours or three examples of saviours? Remember how it said they should save people through their righteousness? That's how Daniel saved people, through his righteousness, so that people looked at him and said, I want to be like him. I want to try a little bit harder to try and do that. I know I'm not going to make it, but I'm certainly going to have a go. This is what Daniel did. Turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. And there's Daniel in Babylon, glittering and sparkling like a diamond in the sky. It's just such a beautiful, beautiful image. As Winston Churchill said, only when it's dark can you see the stars. And for the darkness of the last 70 years, there's Daniel in that firmament of Babylon and he's been twinkling away. And everybody's seen him. And he's got a long-lasting legacy now. That's the sort of person I want to be like. Someone that if you hang around you associate with, you become a better person. Daniel would be one of those people. If you were with him, you would want to elevate. You'd want to rise up. You're not, not a toxic person. What sort of person are we? Are we better for people, sorry, are people better for hanging around us, for associating with us? Or when, when people see us coming, do they go, oh, here he comes again, you know? And you always wish people would say, sir, without adding, you're making a scene. What sort of people are we? Are we like Daniel? Do we have that, that good influence? Not because we walk around, oh, everyone follow me. We've got to have some influence around this place. And you better listen up. It's nothing like that. Not a thing. Of course he was extreme. There's no doubt he was extreme. He didn't settle for ordinary. He wasn't into mediocrity, brothers and sisters. He was a leader. He was an example. He was a saviour. He was like the Messiah to Israel at this time. He glittered and he drew people to him. And we all want to be just a little bit more like that. Any wonder the king planned to elevate him above everybody else. But why do they object? Because the men object to this. They hate it. Then the president and the satraps sought to find a ground of a complaint against him with regard to the kingdom. Of course they rejected. They were racist, first of all. There's no way they're going to have a Jew ruling over them, telling them what to do, obviously. But of course they envied his success. I mean, that's what they wanted. Above anything else, they wanted that power. They wanted the money. They wanted the influence that came with that elevator position. And of course, their own ambitions would have been completely cut off had Daniel taken that position and they wouldn't be able to pass on you know the handouts to their mates and now Daniel's going to be honest and you can imagine a politician for 68 years who knows any politicians who have been there for 68 years and they're squeaky clean and if you went through their life with a fine tooth comb you know when they go on their business trips and they are uh, and they claim for this and that that not a single receipt is out of place and these are the sort of people who are looking for any tiny little molehill they can make a huge mountain out of, right? This is what these people are like. They can't find it with Daniel. He's perfect in that sense. He's blameless. He's guiltless. It's, it's incredible. And of course, their desire for corruption and just to skim a little bit off the top because that's how you work. It's how they roll out there in the business world. It's how they roll in politics. Doesn't matter. You know, I want you to make the sacrifices and I talk tough, but don't expect me to make them. And it's all right for me to take a little bit off the side because after all, I work hard. And their, their scope now for corruption and to skim off the top would be severely curtailed 
because of Daniel. He's too good for them. Way too good. You know, I've got this mate at home and he's, he's, he's actually like Daniel. He really is. He's so good like that. It actually irritates me in some ways because <laughs> and it's like that. I hate it. I want to be good. It doesn't irritate me. I love him to death. He's in a job where they've got to buy up land on behalf of the government so they can put roads through. Now, you can imagine the people who buy this up, how they assign the monetary value to it, how it could be easily uh, inflated. And the per people that own the land in advance in the future can predict, obviously, where the roads are going to go and, and have family members involved with owning land and they could make a lot of money out of that. And Friday afternoon, and it's happened before, Friday afternoon, in comes one of these, uh, these papers and they want this brother just to quickly sign off on it. You know, we haven't got time now, but do you mind just signing off on this? You know, inflated by hundreds of thousands of dollars, which would later be divided up through the various bank accounts. How easy would it be just to put his signature on it, not even think, no one's going to look at it. I mean, it's a government. It's a government um, faculty. No one takes any notice of what goes on there. They're using our money. Why would they? And he wouldn't do it. And they were swearing at him. And he wouldn't do it because he was honest. And people hate that because their chance for corruption is completely nullified. This is Daniel. He's so good, brothers and sisters, you can honestly hardly even look at him. And like I, like I intimated, like, do we dislike people that are better than us? Like, do we? Do they irritate us? I mean, everyone dislikes somebody who thinks they're better than you. Daniel didn't think he was better than anybody. You know what his only weakness was? Daniel's only weakness was that he obeyed God rather than man. And they said, well, they looked but they couldn't find any ground for complaint and they found no fault in him. It was so beautiful. They found no fault in him because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. And they said, well, we're not going to give up. We shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. So they're going to set him up. That's what they're going to do. And when it says there that they... Verse 6, these presidents and the satraps came by agreement. That coming together by agreement is a tumult. This tumult could be on your side and back slapping and so happy and getting you all excited. Or this tumult could at the very next moment be screaming out, crucify him, crucify him. This is that sort of tumult. And they come together and they've got this great idea in verse 6 to proposed to the king and to pander to his ego in such a way and the king knows better. Come on, how good would it be, O oh king, if only for 30 days nobody made any petition to anything else but to you, God, like king. Oh, shucks, you know. They do that anyway, don't they? No, no, no. Everyone's praying to their own gods. But for 30 days, just you. You'd be the only God in the constellation completely. And he starts to think to himself, because this is the tumult in verse 11 that come to Daniel in verse 11. They came by agreement, same idea, same word. And they find Daniel when he's making his prayer and they go, ha ha, Daniel, you're not saying a prayer to like God, are you? Looks like you're not going to get that promotion. Nah, just kidding. We're going to have you killed. And it's the same tumult in verse 15 where these men came by agreement again, gathered together to the king and said, you know, king, we have a law and it can't be changed. Yeah, he should be crucified. Sorry, it can't be changed. Daniel's got to go on the lion's den. And so the king, in verse 6, is so, he's so enamoured by this. And he thinks, it's great. 
But he wants to check, of course. But is everybody in agreement? Do they really all think I'm a God? Yeah, of course, everybody. Everyone. They're liars. Daniel never agreed to this. Never at all. And the tension ratchets up as the king's pride is successfully appealed to. And he's going to be deified now. And immediately upon signing it, he would have felt guilty. And he definitely, absolutely had regret. And so Daniel, look what he does. As he's done before, verse 10, Daniel knew. And Daniel knew, he's not ignorant of this, that the document had been signed. He went to his house where he had windows his upper chamber, open towards Jerusalem. He got down on his knees and three times a day he prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. So, do you know what's incredible about this? Like, why would he pray? Like, why? It's only 30 days. Isn't it better? Isn't it more important that you survive? Isn't it more important that you as the leader of the people get through this little challenge. Why not just close the windows? I mean, after all, Christ did say, don't do your prayers in public. Why would he do it? Why would Daniel do that? And sorry, um, there's a good slide for you to put in your Bible as well. It's in Peter's writings, but we're not going to do it with that. I've already had plenty of brothers and sisters say, Brother Matt, why do you go through your slides? You put them in there, you don't use them. I know. I keep making that mistake. I apologise. I always get my capabilities mixed up with my ambitions, I promise. So, why pray? Well, first of all, because he's our example. He's their example. He's the leader and the captain, and people follow him. In chapter 1, when he decided that he wouldn't eat, oh, sorry, eat the king's food and drink the wine of Babylon, that gave the power and the strength to those other three. That when Daniel wasn't there, they would say to themselves, you know, first of all, they'd say, where's Daniel? And they would slap each other and say, hey, we've got to stand for ourselves now. Daniel would stand, we'll stand. So there's kids at home. And mum and dad say, no, we're not praying tonight. And the little kid would go, but mum, Daniel did. Imagine the parents shamed into praying. He's their example. He's their model. He had to. If Daniel doesn't pray, the whole nation stops praying. And if we're getting towards the end of the 70 years, I don't think chapter 9 is the prayer he's praying, and we'll talk about that tomorrow, but it doesn't matter. It's the tenor of the type of prayer that he, that he often prays. It's the calibre of the prayer. It's the desperation towards Jerusalem, looking forward to going home. He hasn't got time. How many prayers would you miss out on over 30 days? Where's our maths teachers again? How many is it, Jeff? I can't help it. It's 90 prayers. Thanks, Brother Jeff. <laughs> it's 90 prayers. He can't afford the luxury of foregoing 90 prayers. In fact, like, he's got he's to pray. Christ went through as our example. And because of that, we look to him because of Daniel. We look down the, the annals of time back to Daniel and we all think, if he prayed, I can pray. Three times a day. And habit. Habit. That's why he prayed. Number two. Why did he pray? He prayed for habit. Is habit bad? Isn't repetition bad? No. Repetition is not vain. It's vain repetition that's vain. We used to have this older brother at a meeting in Lismore. He used to say the same prayer every time he was asked on a Sunday. And I wouldn't, get a, I wouldn't attribute to him and say, oh, that was a vain prayer, even if I knew it off by heart. But it was his prayer. There's nothing wrong with re repetition. It's vanity that takes away any of its uh, value. Daniel had a habit of praying. Does anybody know how many prayers he said in 70 years? Now, this is a hint that gave Daniel uh, 
strength for 70 years? Does anybody know? <laughs> three times a day times 360 times 70. Now, I added this up before I came and I had a maths teacher at home check it for me. <laughs> I got 100% on this one. So I'll just um, find my notes again and check. Now let me have a look down here. It's around 75,000 prayers, faithful, fervent prayers over 70 years. And people go, oh, you know, I find it difficult to pray. I do do. Sometimes I forget to pray. I think, what am I doing? I don't think Daniel did. He may have had some ups and downs, but he's pretty consistent three times a day looking out his window towards Jerusalem. Habit gets you somewhere. And we go, but that's too hard. I just like, I like to pray when I feel like it. Brothers and sisters, you pray when you feel like it. You're not going to pray in the hard times. Prayer gets you through the hard times. You don't want to be at the whim of your emotions when you feel like it. Imagine being at the whim of your emotions, waiting to pray when you feel like it. When you're down, you don't feel like it. When you're angry, you don't feel like it. When that brother or sister said those nasty comments to you, you don't feel like it, especially not praying for them. No way. Here, here's the thing. We all want to be disciples, don't we? Because people go, oh, but it's, it's, life as a disciple shouldn't be hard because it's, it's following Christ. He's called us. We're chosen. Do you know what the... You know, think about the etymology of the word disciple. What, what's at the base of it? Discipline. Now, that sort of, sort of rubs you the wrong way. I, I like the word disciple better. But there's discipline at the base of it. And when we think about it, we go, ooh, that feels a little different. But that's what it takes. Discipline. And it's hard. And we need to make sure we do it all the time. Life as a follower of Christ. These long habits that Daniel had, uninterrupted, rigid habits for 70 years that set him in good stead. That's why he was strong. How often do we seek to be spontaneously revved up after a talk or a Bible school or some you know, weekend away? And they're good, by the way. They're fine. But unless that's shackled to reading, prayer and fellowship, the three greatest things that we have in life, it's just going to fade away. We've got to seek more understanding through the scriptures and through books that expound the scriptures. And we've got to pray to our Heavenly Father that we can not only take that information in and we can uh, make something of that information so that we can practice it in our life, but then in fellowship we go to our community and we share it. They're the three greatest things that we have. And we've got to make sure any, any revival that we have in the truth, anything that refreshes us, is securely, uh, as we said before, harnessed to a daily routine. It's worth doing. And so on my phone here, I've got this little, um, little buzzer that I have three times a day. And it just is titled PT. I've had it for years. And it means prayer time. And I don't get on my knees and I don't face Jerusalem. And you know what is so hopeless about me? I don't even listen to it. I just go, oh, it's buzzing again, turned off. But it does remind me. And I do get to the end of the day and I think, oh, I didn't do that. Three times a day. You can choose the times. It's an apostolic practice. It's a Daniel practice. It was a Christ practice. It's good for us to have something, something solid in our life something that's concrete that we do often. He prayed out of habit. And also, brothers and sisters, it was definitely the safest option by far. Absolutely by far the safest option. What would you rather do, fall into the hands of the living God or jump into Nebuchadnezzar's fiery furnace? Would you rather get thrown into the lion's den out of disobedience and turn around and see your whole nation that you stood up for for so long all turn away with you? What would you rather do? It was the safest option for, for Daniel and he honoured God. Absolutely honoured God and what he did. And the, the habit and the sincerity of Daniel got him through it. Now, we know what happened. And I'm all out of sorts today because the time has changed. So what time do I have to finish today? 11. It's fantastic. A little bit more. Okay, well, we're speeding through it. That's good. Now, it's the safest thing possible. 
And so what happens? Well, Darius, he's pretty upset with himself and he can't even sleep that night. And he tries, he's longer, he stays up for as long as he can to deliver Daniel and he can't do it. It's hopeless. Who'd want to be a king of the Persians? I'd hate to be a king. I'm just kidding. But King Sin, which is what he really represents here, he's king of self. Let's, it's all about me for 30 days. He can't deliver you. There's no way at all. And in goes Daniel. A stone was brought, laid on the mouth of the den in uh, verse 16, and the king sealed it with his own signet. And in he goes. Now, we're going to look right at the end. And you're going to, we're going to have a little question and answer session. I wonder what Darius knew about Daniel's faith and the interpretation of Daniel 2 and what Daniel believed and the hope of the gospel. And it's quite interesting when he makes his decree at the end. And so you have this, these ideas here which are contrasted because you have a king, and there's no doubt when Daniel went into the lion's den, he must have been shaking like that because it's a fearful thing. But he had faith, and once he saw the growling lions settle and he found a place to sleep, he probably slept very soundly. Meanwhile, the king had sleep flee from him and he couldn't sleep because he was worried and anxious all night. It's quite, a, it's quite an image, actually. And then the desperate king in the morning races out and he comes near the den where Daniel was in verse 20. He cries out in a tone of anguish. King declared Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to deliver you from the lion's den? And then Daniel says to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him. And also before you, O king, I have, I have done no harm. No harm's come to him. There's so many images here. So what's important or what strikes you about verse 21? Well, take note, this is the first time Daniel speaks. He didn't speak when the king said, I'm going to earmark you for number one. He didn't speak when he knew they were looking for opportunity and checking out, Daniel, can we just have all your records for the last, I don't know, 60 odd years, please? Yeah, sure. What do you need? No, nothing. Didn't ask. When they, when they found him and took him away, didn't say a word, like a sheep to the slaughter. And this is the first, he's so much like Christ. It's just such a wonderful type here. We find out more about Christ looking at Daniel. How hard must it have been? He's blameless. And then it says, I've not been harmed. That's chapter three. Remember when they came out of the fiery furnace? This is Daniel's fiery furnace here, the lion's den, where he has to stand by himself, not harmed, as the three friends weren't harmed. We know that. Does anybody know in the New Testament where the furnace and the lion's den are put together in a single verse? Yeah, Hebrews 11, what's it say? Yes, shut the mouth of lions and I'm hoping you can remember because this is the last lines on for me. Is it quench fire? Stop fire? Quench the power of the fire. Thank you. I thought I was going to have to stand here for the next five minutes. There it is. Parallel in Hebrews 11. And then the king, pretty upset he is, he gets those men who have maliciously accused Daniel. Now, surely you've looked up the word maliciously there. What's it in the AV, by the way? In verse uh, 24, the men that have maliciously accused Daniel says here in my ESV. What is it in the AV? Okay, accused. You look it up, you know what it means? It means to chew up or devour. So we had Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 3 roaring with anger and it means to be heated up that was the fiery furnace he was a metaphor for that and now we have these men these are the ravening lions 
These are the predators. These are the ones who are looking for prey. These are the persecutors and the liars. And they're the ones who have been trying to, the whole time to chew up Daniel. And this is why these chapters are relevant to us. We go, well, yeah, but I'm never going to be thrown into a fiery furnace. Taken. Given. And I'm not going to be thrown into a lion's den. Okay. But you will have people that want to chew you up and devour you and destroy your life. And you're going to have the heat of people's anger just because, not because you walked into the office and went, right, I'm going to be a good boy now. And everyone's going to see how much better than you I am. No, it's not the reason. It's because you've started to be consistent like Daniel. And they're going to hate you for it. You might attract some to God because you are trying to glitter like a star, but you will suffer their anger more often than not. And they will, they will backbite you and they will, they will seek to devour you. And that's what Daniel faced. But look what happens to them. Them and their families thrown to the lion's den and I bet they were hungry lions. And then Darius... He writes to all his kingdom, to all people's nations and languages. <coughs> he made a decree. Everybody must fear and tremble the God of Daniel. Now, work with me with this one. Look at these next verses here. Verse 26 and 27. I'm going to ask you a question because Daniel evidently has taught Darius so much about the truth. He's taught him about the gospel and he's taught him about all the visions that he's seen and the hope of Israel. And he's taught him about the kingdom that is to come and the Messiah. Tell me where this comes from. When Darius says, I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God. For he is the living God. Where's that from? That's Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4, after he had his sanity returned to him. He praised the living God. Daniel told Darius about Nebuchadnezzar's episode. Daniel told him, not just from a history book what happened, but Daniel told him why it happened, because he was proud and he was beginning to be a narcissistic king again and oppress the poor. Darius got it. He's a living God enduring forever, and his kingdom shall never be destroyed. Where's that from? It's Daniel 2.44. Daniel's told him about the stone. And Daniel's told him that, Darius, you're the breast and arms of silver. It's not going to last forever. And Darius has accepted it. First time. Nebuchadnezzar wouldn't. He said, his kingdom shall never be destroyed. What about this? And of his dominion, there shall be no end. Where's that from? Where's it talk about God's dominion being everlasting? Over and over again, what chapter's that? It probably is in there, but it's definitely punctuated in chapter 7, where Daniel must have told Darius, you know what, a few years ago now I had this vision, I was standing on the seashore of four nations, because this is the parallel to the vision of chapter 2. And as, as if Daniel didn't see it. I mean, if we can comment and say, oh, Nebuchadnezzar saw his kingdom like a mighty warrior, an image of a man, Daniel would have said, Darius, God gave me this vision. This is how he sees the kingdom of men, as ravening beasts. And unfortunately, their dominion will come to an end, but not God's. Darius quotes that. And verse 27, he delivers and rescues. Where's that from? Was it just because he saw Daniel come out of the lion's den? Or was there a parallel account with chapter 3 where Nebuchadnezzar said, you know what, no God can rescue like this. Darius could see that. It changed the king's command. And he works signs and wonders. Where's that from? That's Nebuchadnezzar again. Nebuchadnezzar, after he's healed and his mind comes back to him, he says... This is the God that can work signs and wonders. I find this absolutely amazing. This king has been taught by Daniel. Daniel is our man. He is our example. He is Israel's saviour in Babylon. 
and I want to be a little bit like him. And I've got to say, brothers and sisters, I think he'd be ashamed of me. <laughs> Surely you want to be a bit more like him. It's times like this from a Bible school when we can all go home with our families. You can talk to your kids about it too. It's not, we're not looking at the kids' stories anymore. These are stories for adults to charge our lives and to give us motivation to continue.